Hey guys, in today's episode, Alex and I go over the top mistakes that you're making that are keeping your glutes small. This is a no gatekeeping zone, so that includes you. Please share this with a friend that is trying to grow their glutes. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you on the inside. Alex, you talked about something on your story this morning that I absolutely loved that you brought up, and it was the aspect of being in this diet of how grateful you are for it because it's allowing you to take care of yourself in the midst of all the craziness going on right now. Yes, as I normally would, I am notorious for putting myself last as I have my list of things get larger and larger. And so me prioritizing my nutrition, my cardio, my training, all those things will find its way to being non-existent in my routine, thus leading me to the place of what many would consider burnout or just complete and utter exhaustion because I'm under fueling, uh, not getting enough physical activity, not getting enough sunlight and just sitting in front of my computer all the time. And so by being in this diet and being very uh, stringent to it, it is something that I have been so grateful for because at this point, being in week four at this time, I would probably had thrown in the towel definitely last week because we had travel over the weekend. I had a lot of stuff going on with my clients as well as my competitors. Uh, Just enough things that I could have not left my desk every day and probably still not gotten the stuff done. And so that was a great representation to me to still get my steps in. Now, were there days where I was under on my steps? Yes. Were there days where I was behind on my food and had to have a large evening meal to get on point? Yes. But on the greater majority of the days, I was hitting my food, I was hitting my steps, and that was a big benefit to me, still being able to go into this week not feeling completely overrun and overly exhausted. So very, very grateful. And since this is the first time that you've dieted in a while, is this also the first time that you've really stuck for, let's say, four weeks, and I'm unsure if that's correct, uh, to being able to show up for your health in this way? Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's been close to five years since I have dieted or or tracked stringently in general. And it's been something where I'll have spurts. And it's it's interesting because I've had so much experience tracking. I would say that I've tracked my nutrition for well over a decade at this point. And it being something where I can eyeball things and feel pretty confident in that. But it's also, if, if you're not, it, it's very similar to the thing where if you're not using it, you lose it. And that eyeball technique only stays so strong, I think, if you are very, I guess, not, is it consistently at least putting things on the scale to get a number, whereas I'm just eyeballing and then that eyeball just gets a little weak over time. And so there would be seasons where I'd have uh, tracking more consistently, but it would be only three or four weeks to where I'd find something going on or something that I needed to take care of within work that just took greater priority. And I would fall off the ship for a little bit, be out of it for one to three weeks, and then I'd get right back on. And that's really what the last you know, four or five years has been for me, where I'd have good good months, I'd have a crappy month, I'd have great months, and it would just be kind of all back and forth. Whereas now having the direct goal, it's something that I've I've got to be good for at least 12 weeks. That's why at the beginning I was saying I was so excited for you to be selfish to feel this and recognize burnout doesn't have to happen as soon. I know we have a ton on our plate and burnout might still happen, but being able to really care for yourself in those ways I think is so, so powerful. And for tracking, I think the biggest thing that it gets harder if you're just eyeballing the whole time is plates and silverware and the vessels you're using changing. Because I even have a hard time as someone who regularly weighs their food, if the plate or bowl sizes change drastically or I'm in a different place and the bowls are different, it's kind of hard to be like, is that the same amount? Because it looks very different in those different vessels. So I think it's always great to kind of have a touch point to see, okay, what does this look like in a bowl that I might be used to seeing more regularly now so that I can carry that over as I use it? I agree. And I think that tracking nutrition is a big part of what we're talking about today in our podcast. 
correct. We are talking about mistakes that might be keeping your glutes small. I know. I'm excited to dig into this as this is something that over the the past decade of work has been a large focus within our clients and we've seen a lot of success. And I think we've got a lot of tidbits to share with everyone to really give them the details on how to make sure that their glutes do not remain small and get past the frustration of why are my glutes not growing. Now, is it important for males to work out glutes or it's really, it's more of a female exercise, right? I mean, it would be more of a question for you because I I think that uh, most males getting into the gym, I know that for myself, it was sports specific majority. There was also a female component to it as well. You are assuming that the ladies love a little bit more muscle. So as a lady who loves a little bit more muscle, would you say that men having glutes is important? Oh, I love that you have a dong. <laughs> it's the freaking best. You know, the one thing I feel like I really missed out on. So baseball pants are a beautiful, beautiful invention. And I met you when you had stopped playing baseball. And I really think that I should get the chance to now see you in baseball pants. Okay. Well, you can fill them out for sure. <laughs> That's going to be, I mean, I'm all about that. If you want to buy me some baseball pants, I'll put them (laughs) on for you. I think another important aspect, other than just looking at the aesthetic side, which we still love to be able to see, is the aspect of health and what it does for your pelvic health and being able to keep you able as you age. When it comes to glute training, I think it's important for everyone, especially with the greater majority of individuals sitting at a desk for a large part of their day, sitting in their car, not getting as much activity in general, it's going to be important because those glutes are just not going to be getting a whole lot of tension or resistance that they're going to be placed under and putting them in a disadvantageous position uh, just from a general health standpoint. That is a phenomenal point you actually brought up just because people truly are sitting a large portion of the day and that's not engaging those muscles really at all. So if you were to say, what is one of the top mistakes people make when trying to grow their glutes, what would it be? Exercise execution and intensity when perfecting that exercise execution. Because when we look at growing the glutes, it is going to be something where we have to put a resistance on the tissue that is going to force the tissue to adapt. And so if we're not executing the movements properly to place that tension on the muscle, and then we're not adding enough load to make it challenging enough for the tissue to adapt, then nothing is going to happen. And so I think that these two things in combination are going to be the most important things when it comes to truly growing your glutes. Now, how does someone figure out how to have the best execution or intensity when they are trying to grow their glutes? Well, I would use our YouTube channel as we have invested lots and lots of time, lots and lots of money, and have incredible exercise execution videos on a lot of different glute training movements. And so utilizing that as a free reference point that we are walking through every single exercise in detail and giving you um, some of the common mistakes that people make and then being able to film yourself compare to that video and just go back and forth and really try to align with what that video is. Now, in a situation that is going to expedite that process, you could work with a coach who is going to give you that feedback on a week-to-week basis and look at your exercise execution and tell you specifically what you're doing wrong. And so I think that working with a coach is the best way to go about this. You certainly can do it with spending zero dollars and doing it the way that I said with utilizing the YouTube channel and comparing and contrasting, but you may not see the nuance that of, of small details that you are maybe mis-executing or something along those lines. And so having that expert eye is a tremendous help, especially if you are someone who has not had just the basic training of resistance training. Mm-hmm. Because for myself, and we talked about this on the podcast, that I was very fortunate to have a great strength conditioning coach when I was in middle school. And from middle school on, his big thing was technique and execution and making sure that everything was really, really crisp so that when you did go to higher loads, that you were in a safer spot to execute. And so 
I, I understand that that's a luxury and that's not something that everyone gets to experience in their weightlifting journey. And so if you are someone who has not had that experience, going with the coach is definitely, definitely your best choice and in really investing into that person of, hey, this is where I'm at and I really need you to help me get to an understanding of just like basic anatomy, basic function of how my body's supposed to work, how it's supposed to feel and, and going through it that way, a very hands-on experience is going to be a necessity for you because trying to um, improve your exercise execution with not a whole lot of knowledge on those basic principles of functionality and anatomy, it's going to be pretty tough because you're going to think you're doing things a certain way. But then once you put those videos side by side, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm, that does not how mine looks. And you may, even on the flip side, may feel as though that it looks the same, but in, in reality, how you're, how you're doing it, how you're getting from point A to point B is not the best way for what you're trying to accomplish. And so within exercise execution, it is something that's going to take repetitions. It's not something you're going to go into the gym and it's going to click for you right away. It may, you may have a luxury and, and that be the case, but more often than not, it's going to be week after week, just trying to fine tune small details and take taking one or two things and getting a little bit better at them until you feel comfortable to really push yourself from a load perspective. Physique development on YouTube, for those wondering. Now, when it comes to the intensity side, how does someone improve on that as well? Intensity is a tough one. And this is going to, again, come through repetitions and understanding of how you're feeling in the set and getting to assess your, like how close you're getting to failure throughout your training and those different factors. So it is a challenging bit to really align and see where that intensity needs to be. For a early trainee, this is probably the most difficult part because as soon as you feel burning or you feel greater tension or you start to feel maybe some of the supporting musculature starting to not necessarily give out, but be feeling a little bit weaker or anything of that nature, anything that feels different, you're probably like, okay, this is too far. <laughs> this is too much. And being able to trust that that's not something that's bad, but pushing through and pushing through fatigue and maintaining exercise execution, that's going to be the thing that just comes with time. And so I would really focus on if you're just starting out in your journey, it being exercise execution first, getting that foundational work in. And then once you feel confident there, pushing the envelope within your intensity markers, and this is really where that video comes into play because as you, let's say you feel very comfortable within your um, RDLs, we use the RDLs and you feel great with your execution, you start to push the envelope with your weight and you say, okay, I'm going to push myself to failure. This is what I, this is, I want to see how many I can do with this weight. And you have a video of you doing, let's say six repetitions with this particular weight. And now you're just going to give it all of your effort and hopefully you can get more than six. And then what you want to do is compare those last few repetitions in that set to six to the last few repetitions to whatever that failure set is. Where was the, the breakdown in your form? Was there any breakdown? Or did you have way more left in the tank? Did it look like you actually had more and you just kind of gave up on yourself mentally first? And so this is where the video is going to be the best trial and error for this and intensity markers and utilizing tools like RPE within rate of perceived exertion or RIR, reps in reserve. Those are great tools to assess overall intensity throughout your training, but you've got to know what intensity even feels like or looks like to be able to assess with those tools. And so utilizing video and understanding that it's going to be a time game more than anything is the most important thing when trying to get your intensity into alignment. One of the my favorite posts that you've made was actually talking about intensity and people self-selecting their one rep max and how often or what the percentage was for how much they were actually able to lift. They were undershooting themselves by a ton. They were getting six, seven, eight, nine, ten at their one rep max. And that just goes to show how you are 
as humans, we're resistant to that change. And when we feel that resistance, it's hard to push past it. But that's actually one of my absolute favorite things about lifting. And what's given me the most in my life due to lifting was being able to push through that hard. Because I had had hard in my life before, of course, but the gym really showed me how I was able, it was able to be a vehicle for me to show me how capable I was to push past when it just got hard. Because there's times in our RPE training has been really helpful of focusing on what is the RPE that you are exerting here. Because I found myself of thinking, oh, this was probably about an RPE 8 because it felt hard. But then when I really asked myself, how many more reps could you have done at this weight? And I was like, oh, this was actually closer to an RP six or five. And being able to see I am actually so much more stronger than I give myself credit for. And that's how I'm able to push up that intensity. Another aspect that you've really helped me with is you brought execution into my life fully. When I met you is when I I truly started to learn about the musculature and what needed to be done to truly stimulate the tissue. And with that, I got really honed in on execution. And so much so that I, I gave up some of that intensity because I wanted every rep to look perfect. I wanted every rep to look like a teaching rep, but that's not the reality of muscle growth, you need to push yourself to failure, as you mentioned, and push yourself to the limit. And sometimes that comes with a little bit of breakdown in form, but you had to get under that weight to even know you could get under that weight to push yourself to have the intensity to have the muscle growth. And I feel as though the past few years has specifically been me honing in on merging together the execution and intensity to truly see the results that I want. I think that it is important that you go to both extremes. You have the seasons yeah. in which you are uh, focusing very heavily on execution because you're learning maybe some new movement patterns or you are kind of taking some steps back and reevaluating some of the exercises that you've done so long and you've been having a reoccurring injury within that exercise. I think a back squat is a really great example of this where a back squat is one of the first movements that everyone is taught, I feel like. And with it being more of a foundational movement in many's eyes, and it is a very technical movement. There's a lot of moving parts. It's multi-joint. It, there's many things that could go wrong in that exercise. And oftentimes people are taught that movement with just a point A to point B. You get squat down to ass to grass, you stand up and that's all that matters. When as there is way more to that movement than just going from point A to point B. And so people have a lot of reoccurring injuries in that movement because the movement pattern that they're taught is not really one that functions with their body. And so then you have to take steps back to allow for you to really understand how your body functions, how it needs to be aligned to have the best squat pattern for your body and, and limb links and those different things. And so you have to go to these opposite ends of the extremes to be able to even understand what that middle ground feels like so that you can sometimes push the boundaries too far in intensity. You can push the boundaries too far with execution and really find that middle ground so that you can execute over the long haul with that intensity and with that execution in place to see the response that you want to see. It's, it's not something that, and I think that some people are maybe a little bit more fortunate within their guidance that they can hit the nail on the head a little bit sooner or they have greater genetic potential within their um, strength or within their muscle density or, or their ability to gain muscle or what have you. But for the vast majority of individuals, this is going to be at maybe a year or two into your journey that it, it's just going to be learning, learning, learning. And even now being a decade plus into my journey, I'm still learning small details about mm -hmm. my training intensity or small executional things and uh, those different factors. So it's an, it's an ever green journey that you're on within both of these different things, but you're really just trying to work in the middle to see the best progress that you can. Another really great point, because talking about some exercises that you don't push the gauntlet, I know there's some for you that um, you were having elbow issues a while ago. So it was 
it's not smart to really push it with doing curls and certain movements because that's going to bring up some pain in my elbow. It doesn't mean that I can't ever have intensity in those movements um, and really hone in on that. And for myself, it was the barbell back squat where my limb lengths make it pretty hard to barbell back squat. And while it's been pretty seldom in my training, even when it was, it wasn't for me to absolutely max out and have the most output because you understood my body was already having a ton of output trying to stabilize all of those joints you were mentioning. And now that we have the super squat bar, though, I'm able to get back into squatting and it's been really fun because I'll be able to chase some intensity with that, that squat bar. The other thing with execution that it's not only going to help you reach your muscle goals, but it's going to allow you to have less injury and less pain so that you can make more progress. I always use the example of you don't want to just spin your wheels. And if you just go in the gym and you're lifting, yeah, it's great you're getting movement. It's great you're being active. But if you're not having intention and knowing how to move your body, then you could just be spinning your wheels and not really be working towards the progress you want. Even though you're putting the time in, you're not getting the outcome that you think that you're working for because you don't have the proper execution. The analogy I like to use is that, and I feel like because no one uses regular pencils anymore, this doesn't uh, apply to everyone or they get it as much, but you're still able to write with a really dull pencil, but a really sharp pencil writes a whole hell of a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so you may be going to the gym with that really dull pencil and feeling like you're still making progress and you don't want to get up and have to go to the pencil sharpener because it's like, that's, that's too much work. I don't want to get up. I'm just going to keep cranking away. At some point, you're going to run out of lead or the pencil is going to break or something along those lines. All you had to do was just get up and refine some of the tools and re sharpen the pencil so that you could write more clearly and more efficiently and brighter and all those different things. And so I think that that's a really, that's the way that I think about it in my head of, um, you can still make progress while you've got some of these nagging injuries, whether it be your knee, your hip, or whatever the situation may be, you're still going to be making progress. But is it as great as it could be if you just took the steps back to fix some of the things that you had going on from an in injury perspective or exercise execution or what have you? Set that strong foundation, but I will be stealing that. So any clients, if you hear that in your check-ins <laughs> coming up, I stole it 100% from Alex. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. What is another common mistake that people make when trying to grow their glutes? The next is going to be exercise selection as well as getting stuck in rep ranges. And I, I put those together because I, I do think that they are important to combine in the sense that exercise selection is something more often than not, women are going to select exercises that are at a higher repetition range that are going to be not dumbbell or barbell specific, but more cable centric, more band centric, those different things. And so when we look at exercise selection, it's really important to understand the literature and what we're trying to accomplish in maximizing overall hypertrophy and how we can over the years adapt these movements and get stronger and more efficient within our movement patterns and those different things. And so when we look at exercise selection, we want to like there's still a value to the band work. There's still value to cable work and those things. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but there's going to be a greater value when you're trying to maximize overall hypertrophy to movements like a bent knee RDL, to movements like a leg press or a hack squat or a barbell back squat if it aligns with your um, with your body, as well as things like a Bulgarian split squat or a hip thrust or movements that are going to be much easier to overload over time and continue to see progress over the long haul relative to doing a banded clamshell for 50 repetitions and being like, why is, why are my glutes not working or why are my glutes not growing? And then week after week, you're just consistently doing the same repetition allotment with the same band and wondering why nothing's changing.
And I think we can even come back to talking about the right exercises for each individual person, where talking about the barbell back squat, a lot of people turn to that and it can be really great to train the glute in the lengthened position. It can be incredible for that, but it might not line up for some people's bodies to be able to really perform the back squat in that way. So it doesn't mean you can never do a barbell back squat. It doesn't mean that barbell back squats stink for growing your glutes. It just means maybe that's not one of the main exercises that I focus on for output. And I can say that that we grew my glutes with really not having barbell back squats in at all because of that exact reason. And we focused on the leg press, the bent knee RDL, and the hip thrust, as well as some kickbacks. And we're able to really hone in on those split squats too. Can't leave those out. Hone in on those and see the growth that I needed because it worked for me and how my body was allowing me to move and have output. I also think that the barbell back squat from a systemic fatigue, your whole body mm -hmm. experiencing the fatigue is a big part of this because you're not just going to train glutes once a week. You're going to probably be training glutes twice a week at the absolute most three times a week. And so if you are doing a conventional deadlift or a sumo deadlift and a barbell back squat on opposing days, let's say you're squatting on Mondays, deadlifting on Thursdays, you may not be recovered by that Thursday session. You may still be experiencing some fatigue from that Monday session from the back squats. Not saying that that's inherently right, but you could very well still be experiencing some fatigue. And if we are wanting to have a greater density of overall volume for the week in training that particular muscle group, we want to pick exercises that are going to cause fatigue and strain on the muscle that we're intending and try to avoid as much as we can, the systemic fatigue that you're going to experience from different exercises like a barbell back squat, like a deadlift. Not to say that they're wrong, but when we're trying to maximize hypertrophy, that systemic fatigue is going to have a negative effect on our ability to accumulate that greater volume. And so if that's your overarching goal, you've got to find exercises that allow for you to train the tissue as frequently as you can, being fully recovered, and being able to progress the, the weight with a lot of those movements under the rep ranges that you've selected. And so being very mindful of that, even if you love the barbell back squat, even if you love the sumo or conventional deadlift, it may not align with your current goal of maximizing overall hypertrophy. And that has to be okay with you if that's your overarching goal. And so Understanding that is very important and being able to allow yourself like looking at the volume, if you are going to utilize those exercises in your training, you may not have the total allotment of sets or the variability in your exercise selection to have a, a, a more, I guess, dense session in general, if you're going to have that systemic fatigue from those different movements. So just being mindful of those things when you're selecting exercises for your training is going to be very important. I definitely feel like that's not always taken into consideration. And I honestly just love having you talk about training because you see such of the full picture anytime you're looking at someone of what is the goal and how do we need to get there and being able to see all of the variables to know what do I need to choose. And that's why you get such incredible results. And when you were talking about, hey, maybe the squat is your favorite, but if you're trying to really stimulate hypertrophy and that's your goal, you might have to do a little bit less of that. And Sable comes to mind when she was going after her pro card, which she did indeed get and win the overall at that show, she wanted her glutes to grow. And we always talked about how she had such, quote, boring programming because she was so clear on what her goal was and you were so clear. It didn't need to be this large variance. You had a very targeted goal of what muscles she had to improve on for stage and were able to just hone in on those movements and do them. And she was the perfect example of, again, having that clear goal and being able to execute it. Because if she didn't truly understand, she could have said, this is boring. I don't want to do these same movements. I don't have as much variance. But she was locked in on that goal that she said she had. She truly did. And you guys were able to get after some really crazy results. Yes, we were. And when it comes to exercise selection and building out a really great training day for glutes, 
We want to have exercises that are going to be biasing that lengthened position, the glutes under tension in that lengthened position with a greater priority. We want to have that in place. We understand that from a literature standpoint, that that's going to elicit the greatest response from a hypertrophy standpoint. And so when we look at this, this is when you're at the end range of an RDL, you're at the, you're at the bottom and you're about to push your hips forward into the concentric portion of the exercise. That is when we want to have the most tension. And as you're listening to this, you may find yourself in a situation where it's like, I rush out of that. I bounce out of that position. <laughs> and then I'm wondering, why are my glutes not growing? That's why. Because you are taking away the most important part that we found from literature from that exercise, and that's your entire goal. And you're robbing yourself of that because the, the, the tension or, or what you're feeling is, is too much. So you want to get out of it and you want to get to the next rep. And all you're, all you're caring about is counting to 10 or counting to 12 rather than maximizing. I'm in rep four, and this is going to be the best rep that I've had the entire set. And you complete that one. And then you say, I'm in rep five, and this is going to be the best rep I've had for this entire set. And that is the mindset that you have to take to every single set to make sure that you're getting the most out of every single training session rather Rather than it being like, I, I finished the training session in 40 minutes and, and I was perfect with my, my rest periods and I was perfect with getting my reps. And it's like, that's not what I, those are great details and can be important, but without having that first intent of making every rep great, it doesn't matter. You're just, you're just going through the motions. And so biasing those exercises, picking maybe two per session that are going to bias that lengthened position. Another thing that we have seen from literature is that we want to be able to bias different lengths of the tissue throughout the entire session. So having some exercises that are more lengthened or mid-range specific. Then we have things that are more shortened specific where with those lengthened exercises, we have the bent knee RDL, we have the leg press, we have the Bulgarian split squats, we have the back squat. When we look at more shortened specific work, we have the 45 degree hip extension. We have the barbell glute bridge or the barbell hip thrust, as well as the kickback variations that you may be uh, aware of and those things being useful tools. And so picking two of those lengthened and maybe one to two of those short and specific exercises and being able to get after those sessions. I'm saying this in a very general way as a quality built out training program is going to have a variance of overall rep ranges, as well as a variance in overall volume allocations and those different factors. But if you were just to to start your glute growth journey, I would pick those two or you know two lengthened and then one to two shortened emphasis exercises and be able to do those twice a week. And you're going to see a lot of really great growth um, by pushing yourself in those different exercises with the execution to match it. And so those are going to be things when we're looking at exercise selection to not try and get too cute with it get great at a handful of movements and crank away at those. Don't try to be like, oh, I saw this person doing this variation of an RDL. And it's like, can you even execute the RDL? Like, do you know 100% that your bent knee RDL is fantastic? Then if not, you don't need to be doing this B stance or this single leg variation where you're losing the support of the other leg or whatever the situation is, just do the RDL. It may not be as, as cute or as Instagram friendly for you to post for your swipe workout, but it is going to be tremendously better for you to actually grow your glutes. The thing that you actually care about and not these, you know, vanity things within, um, getting likes on Instagram or following your favorite influencers swipe workout type situation. So I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> Muscle growth doesn't happen by accident. And that's where the intent comes in. You don't hear about someone accidentally growing huge glutes without any intent or accidentally popping huge muscles out of their shoulders just by picking up a dumbbell. It happens from consistent intent and being able to have that intention as you're carrying out what you need to. So when you're talking about that RDL and someone bouncing out of it, they're stopping where it gets hard. They're feeling challenged. And that's why people don't spend time in the lengthened position is because it's one of the hardest parts of the movement. So the reason your glutes aren't growing is because you don't want to work hard. You don't want to feel the resistance and feel that it can be challenging and push yourself past that challenge. And that can get you stuck and having some small glutes. It can. And, and to speak to the repetition allotment, 
It, it is something where I think we have to focus more on tracking hard reps. When did it really start to get challenging? Did, when did you start to have to push through fatigue? Those are the repetitions that matter the most. From a research, this, the research that I saw, I don't know if this is Chris Beardsley's specific research, but this is where who I saw it from, is that the five repetitions closest to, to failure are going to be the most important repetitions that we have. So those last five reps are the ones that matter most as we reach that threshold of a seven to, to nine RPE or seven to 10 even RPE. And to briefly speak on this is that rate of perceived exertion, RPE, is going to be a number allotment as we're tracking intensity. So when you stand up from a set that you have just completed, you're going to ask yourself the question, how many more repetitions could I complete? At that point, you'll say two, You'll subtract that from 10 and that will give you an RPE of eight. It's that simple. So with those repetitions, we want to maximize the work that we have in those last five reps. And so when we look at things that can be met at 15 reps, that can be met at 10 reps, that can be met at five reps if you're really great at executing right off the jump. But I think that more often than not, individuals are getting to, if, if you have a set of 15, they're getting to 15 with probably another 10 in the tank or another five in the tank off of that. So we never really got to that five threshold that we wanted to have or that those last five reps of challenge that we wanted to have. And so by getting to a lower rep range allotment, that's like a six or an eight and really having to push ourselves within load selection is going to be such a important part because it's much easier to realize you had a lot more left in the tank when you do a set of six relative to a set of 15. Cause you're gonna be like, oh, what was I 11? What was it 12? Oh, and finally I'm to 15. And it's like, you're more so focused on making sure you count all the way to 15 <laughs> than actually assessing your overall intensity. Whereas that set of six, you're, you get to set our rep six and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I still had four or five left in the tank. I need to go up. So it's much easier to assess with those lower rep range allotments. And that's honestly one of the cheat codes that we have here at Physique Development. I, I, will, I will give you, this is a gold nugget. Get out your pen and paper. I've given you already 15 gold nuggets <laughs> today, but this is even more important. More often than not, individuals are coming to us with a training regiment of three to four sets of 10 to 12 repetitions, even higher than that. And the first thing that I do is that I get them into really actually training hard and push them into a training phase that is going to take them to five, six, seven repetitions at a very high intensity. And you see some of those transformations that I have that are the first four weeks of us working together, the first eight weeks of us working together. And really all that's changed is that we're fueling the training. And for the first time in their life, they're training hard and executing well. And that is the cheat code in and of itself to really push themselves within the training and having the program design be in a way that is much more specific to their goals relative to them previously thinking that they're just selecting exercises and being in the, this higher rep range allotment that they're really not getting to the intensity that they think they are to pivot into a, a scenario where they're having someone review the exercises and say, yo, you are sandbagging the shit out of yourself and you need to go up week after week and really challenging themselves and realizing how strong they truly are. And they're seeing the result of what the work that they're putting in is, is becoming, then that's when the true potential is un unlocked because they're actually able to see that they can grow, that they can make progress. And it's because they're actually challenging themselves through their training. And I think a lot of people don't get into that less rep range really ever. And so they never know how strong that they can be. But not only the aspect of going to those less reps, but being able to just have variance in your reps in general. Right now, you just entered a metabolic phase. And listen, I'm under the understanding anything over eight reps is cardio. It just is. And he had me out here doing reps of 15. And I was first losing count. count of getting to 15 because I was just trying to get through it and not die. But I was 
being able to just be reminded of the variance in the types of training and how they can all work together to get you to where you want to go. I have clients that absolutely hate metabolic training or they hate neurological or they love hypertrophy or they love metabolic. It can be all over the board, but I always remind them this is to be able to help you get to where you want to go. And while you might not love this right now, you want the outcome. So we are going to do this to be able to have better uh, stress uh, management when we go to hypertrophy or being able to handle more volume when you go to hypertrophy so that you can see that full picture approach and really see that progress you're wanting. Yeah, I, I think that the the notion that you're going to love every training session when you go in there is, is silly. And if you're going in there loving every training session, the likelihood that you're actually challenging yourself in stuff that you're not good at is super low. And the then the likelihood that you're actually making legitimate progress over time is pretty slim as well. Uh, so I, I would say that be okay with not loving every session. I assure you that I do not love this <laughs> oh. metabolic phase, but I also understand the benefit that I'm going to get from this stimulus. And so then it comes to a point where is the real problem not having the education of why these things are beneficial and they're just, you know, being given a training and say, do this and we'll talk next week. Whereas with, with our athletes, even they, they still, I, I understand the benefit. I don't, I still don't love it, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to do it. And so it's one of those things where by having the understanding and education as to why these things are beneficial allows for you to push through more. And so having the opportunity to educate is the most important thing to me to give that understanding of why this is going to help your next hypertrophy phase, why this is going to help your next strength phase to be in a better position for you to excel and, and, make leaps and bounds of progress uh, as you press forward. I will say one more thing about exercise selection. I'm soft and I will choose the easier exercise if I'm left up to my own devices. Now, sometimes I do like to, you know, have that sadistic torture where I'm like, I just want to go in there and absolutely be demolished by some split squats. But more often than not, I'm going to choose the exercise that's a little bit easier. And that's where having the correct exercise selection and especially the support of a coach can be so helpful because otherwise I really wouldn't have seen the glute growth that I have because I wouldn't have done the exercises that were hard. And that goes back to just not wanting to be under that hard load and having to push yourself past that mentally before you can physically. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. All right, we've gotten through execution and intensity, exercise selection and rep allotment. What is another mistake people make when it comes to growing their glutes? I put this one third because without those first few there, this one can be great and still nothing will happen. And so this one is going to be having enough nutrients to train hard. So food and maximizing overall recovery, because I do think that many individuals are training hard. They can be training hard, but then they are under fueling and not understanding why they're never recovering or seeing the progress that they want to see. I see this so, so often, and I it feels like there's just this major disconnect of, okay, I can be training hard and that's all I need to be able to, to see what I want to see, but this nutrition stuff doesn't really matter. And we always talk about how nutrition and training go hand in hand. You can't see as much success for the training without the nutrition matching that and being able to really look at what your goals are and making sure that the food aligns with it because otherwise you will get into that situation where you could be doing everything right in the gym, but since you're not eating and you're not recovering, then you're not seeing muscle growth because you got to train hard and recover harder. And that is truly one of the only ways you're going to see that muscle growth because muscle growth doesn't happen inside of the gym. In the gym, you're actually breaking down your muscles. When you start to build them back stronger, better, bigger, that's happening when you're recovering. And I think people get so in their mind of, I have to be working hard and feel how hard it is all the time. And they think that not eating enough and not 
feeling sore is like, oh, I'm working really hard. But truthfully, even though they might feel, oh, I'm, I feel so satiated and recovered, so I'm not working as hard, it truly is being able to see that growth. And that really only happens in times out of a dieting phase, which also comes in of people are chronically dieting and not seeing the muscle growth. And I always reference the times that I saw muscle growth was when I was very intentional about it and I was eating to match that intentional nature and intensity in the gym. I think that it has a lot to do with perspective. And so when an individual is training super hard and they're not prioritizing recovery, not prioritizing their nutrition, it is a lack of understanding that the long-term progress that they are negating. They are only focusing on the progress that they're making that day. So they're like, okay, I lifted today. I got my cardio in today. Um, Next up type situation. And you're going to make progress for a short period of time doing that. Like your body is going to do everything in its power to try and adapt to the stimulus that you're placing it under with the nutrients that it does have available to it. And you may make some progress here and there, but you're going to find yourself in a situation where you are having to take deloads much more frequently and probably not actually seeing progress multiple months later. It's going to be like, well, I was, and then nothing's happening now. Whereas if you are able to shift your perspective and say, okay, I want to have great training sessions today, but I also want to have great training sessions in a year from now, two years from now, and so on, you start to see much further down the road and understand that if you're not taking into consideration the nutrition and the recovery, this is going to be a rocky road. Mm -hmm. Because if you try to do this without the food and without the recovery prioritized, you're going to be running into injuries. You're going to have very irritable days for yourself. You're going to have a lot of crappy sleep. You're going to just not be fun to be around and functioning at a very low level. Inflamed. Inflamed. Your your joints are not going to feel great. There's so many downsides to not prioritizing these aspects. And so by changing that perspective, that's going to be the best thing for you to be able to see down the road and understand that you've got to have both to really see the progress that you want to see. And it is, it's, it's a mature thought to have, right? The immature or child in me is like, no, I can just train hard. I can go run around outside and I'll still be fine. Like I'll eat whatever. I'll have some honey buns and be fine and do all that. But the reality is is that that's just not the case. And you can try to fool yourself enough into thinking that you are some genetic elite that doesn't have to do these things, but the likelihood that you are is painfully slim. And so, um, having that emphasis on nutrition and recovery is, is paramount. And with food, it's also getting in enough protein because not only is that going to help with satiation, but that is also going to be that building block to help you build that muscle. So maybe you are eating enough calories, but the allotment is very heavily towards carbs and fats and you're not getting enough protein in. That could also be a factor in play. Now, another factor in regards to food is going to be eating enough food, like I've mentioned, but that also might come with the scale increasing or your pant size increasing. And I find that's a mistake people make is not being willing or able to see the scale go up or see their pant size go up because they are chasing after this muscle growth, but they don't equate, hey, if I have muscle or a different shape to my body, I might change a little bit. The scale might change. My clothes might change. And they get so stuck and I need to stay this weight. I need to stay this size that they're not allowing their body to truly grow to where they need to because they're keeping themselves small. Now, with recovery, I know rest days is definitely a part of that, but what's another aspect or a few aspects of recovery that go into this? Daily movement, getting outside and getting steps in, getting sunlight. I think that those are very important things that people overlook. I know that early on for me, I thought that recovery was just laying on the couch, (laughs) which there is certainly a component to recovery that that is is going to be, uh, but that is not the vast majority of how you should be spending your time. Um, And it's going to help with you, with your digestion, with your metabolic rate, all these different things of just getting this daily movement from a a day-to-day perspective. So those are going to be big. Prioritizing your sleep and getting quality sleep is going to be huge. And then uh, allowing for you to stay hydrated. I think that hydration is going to play a large role here as well. Probably much larger than what 
people may may think because I do think that uh, with just overall brain function and energy and all these things having a big uh, component of that hydration, these are just from a general task and day-to-day uh, perspective is going to have a large role. Yes, definitely. Cannot forget the sleep aspect. And I love that you mentioned the moving because people will train and then they're sitting at their desk all day. They trained and then they're not moving outside of it. And they find themselves really sore too because they really didn't have any movement. So being able to have that in place can help your recovery. But of course, we want to make sure we don't go too far in the other direction of moving too much, doing too much cardio, because that's going to add on of you can't recover if you're doing all of that and don't have the time or food to have that recovery. I'll also add with your static stretching or just general mobility work outside of your resistance training to be important as this is something that I have discovered for myself over the last <laughs> three or four months that uh, has played a large role in my recovery to my training. I can train more frequently. I feel better with each training session by doing these things. And so it, this doesn't have to be something extravagant. It literally can be just 15 to 20 minutes of static stretching in the evening before bed. This is also going to be tremendously helpful for your quality of sleep and getting into a restful state to begin with. So it's a when, when? massive plus like and and you may be laying in bed or laying on the couch before you go to bed anyway watching tv or catching up on your favorite tiktoks which you know i wouldn't say is the best move but <laughs> you're probably doing it um in that time frame you can probably stretch while you that tv show is going on or while that well yeah tiktok you may have to swipe in the middle of your <laughs> in the middle of your stretch but getting that in will be huge for you now, when it comes to one of the last mistakes that people make, what is it? Not giving themselves enough time, thinking that it's going to happen overnight, thinking that they give one or two weeks of really great effort and then they look in the mirror and then they don't see these massive glutes that they've worked so hard for over that time frame and thrown in the towel and given up a little bit too soon and not realizing how much time it really takes to add real density to your glutes. And they may be following their favorite Instagrammer and that person has been blessed by the gods of fat disbursement. And as they gain weight, it goes really nowhere but their glutes. Like there are women on the internet that that's the case, whether that's a BBL or that's real life, <laughs> I don't know. With that being the, the scenario, some individuals get discouraged. And, and I think that staying in your own lane, not allowing for yourself to fall into the game of comparison and, and um, because I think that Instagram or, or social media in general from a fitness standpoint has a lot of pros, but has a myriad of, of cons and the, the comparison to other individuals who are at completely different stages of their fitness journey and thinking that you should be where they're at, or you have this genetic anomaly who is actually at the same place as you in terms of their fitness journey, but they started in a completely different position or, or um, what have you. And then you're comparing to that person and it's just, it's not worth your time. It, it, it's great for us to learn information and to share different techniques and so on and so forth. But looking at another female and then, you know, female or male, because I've, I've fallen into this as well, and being like, well, she looks like this, so I'm lesser than because she looks better than me. And I, I mean, it is very easy for you to see the good in other people and highlight the things that you don't like about yourself and highlight the great things that they have that you don't have. That is the easiest thing to do. And so doing your best to appreciate what someone else has accomplished and how they look and it be a model for you that what you want to do is possible. What you want to do is is accomplishable because someone else has done it. That's the only way that you should be looking at it, not comparing of, well, she has this and I my glutes are kind of small and but hers are hers are really great. And like she gets to go out and have a free meal. But like anytime I go out and have a free meal, I gain weight and and I'm fat and she's not fat. But I I, I hate how I look. I love how she looks. Like it is a 
I mean, a snowball effect of a shit show and not necessary whatsoever because there's nothing conducive that comes from that. And getting out of that and allowing for yourself to just commit to the goal that you have and giving yourself real time, not three months, not six months, give yourself two years and really just crank away and stay in your lane and focus on what you're wanting to accomplish. And I think you will be amazed at what you're able to do in that amount of time. Marie freaking tweet. I tell my clients all the time of you're doing everything that you need to be doing, but I just you just need more time doing it to be able to reach the goals that they desire. And I'll actually often have clients send pictures of how they want to look from people that they've seen so that I can have an understanding of what their expectation is or what their brain is picturing when they use certain words. And I'm able to give them an understanding of, hey, do I think that this is possible with the lifestyle that you want to live and how this fits into your life and what it is going to take to get to that? Is it going to take three plus years? to get to that physique? Is it going to take you having to give up some things that you're doing in your lifestyle now to be able to reach that? And I'll have clients make comments of really liking the way that I look or wanting to look the way that I do or comments on my glutes growing, which of course I love all of them. And I'm so proud of everything that I've accomplished, but I always break it down for them of, hey, I competed for seven years. I was extremely on top of every single variable that was my life for seven years. So and I was very intentional during that time. So if you haven't had just seven years to only focus on your physique, then it's going to be really hard to have the same results within seven years. You could still work hard and have great results, but they might not be the same because of the diligence that I took during that time. And then also having to point out that Again, it took time to even see those changes. So when I look back to when I competed the first time, to the second time, third time, fourth time, I was doing a lot of the same things. Of course, I learned and improved along the way, but I was doing a lot of the core of the same things, but it did take time to be able to see that growth truly happen. And I recently put up a side-by-side of my glute growth, and I put the years that the pictures were from to truly show this time took seven years to make happen. This wasn't a 12-week transformation. This wasn't a one-year transformation. This was seven years of really having intention of growing my glutes, and this is what was able to happen. So time is such an important variable here that cannot go understated when looking at any type of muscle growth, which I also like to bring up when people think, oh, I can't lift heavy because I'm going to look really bulky and manly, where Again, it took a lot of time being very consistent to look the way that I do now. So it's definitely not going to happen again by accident from you picking up a heavier weight every once in a while and that being what you do. I would also say that anyone who has seen you would not put you in the category of bulkier man. Yes. (laughs) That was uh, implied in my head because I don't view myself that way. And I will say I've, I've spent a lot of time with bodybuilders, uh, bikini athletes, all those things. And uh, I, in, in terms of Sue's consistency, I've been with her basically every day for the last five years. And when we talk about really tracking every small detail, I'm not sure that I've seen many individuals track to the same extent that she has in that time window. So, I mean, when we, when she says like, I tracked everything, she really does mean that and, uh, put in everything that she could and, and had, I mean, relentless focus on that being her goal to make these things happen. And the progress and growth that she had did not come by coincidence or, or by luck. It was by very, very diligent effort. And so if you're wanting to have that, it is a day in and day out grind. Like there are a lot of days that I was with her. And I was like, fuck, man, I would, I would have <laughs> gave up about a week or th- two, maybe a month ago type situation, and she's still chipping away and going. And so if you want to have that, it, it takes a, a special human to have that type of focus and tenacity on a day-to-day basis. But if you got it, go for it. Go for it. 
Well, I loved sitting down and chatting with you about training. Like I said, I absolutely love just hearing you talk on training. And of course, something we're both very passionate about, which is glute growth. So is there anything else that you would say to someone trying to grow their glutes or anything to wrap up the episode? I don't think I have anything else to add to growing your glutes in general, but if you are struggling with comparison, I know I spent a little bit of time speaking on that. I will have the link to our episode digging into comparison and how Sue and I have combated that over the years in the show notes. And if you and your friend are wanting to grow your glutes, go ahead and share this with he or her, and we'll catch you in the next episode.